All right, thanks guys. Just want to uh, thanks Kate and, and Christoph for inviting me to here, and it's great, uh, great uh, meeting. My dad would be proud. I actually texted him, and uh, he jumped on the Zoom earlier this morning because I told him he would love it. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, also uh, first time here at the Seattle uh, Science Foundation. It's a very nice facility. Appreciate the hospitality. So this is just a, a little part of uh, endoscopic fusion um, performing the discectomy, uh, the optimal discectomy. And this is not working. How does this work? Okay, so what is an endoscopic fusion? Obviously, we've saw a bunch of variations here, um, but really, to me, it's a modified MIST lift because you know your your kind of largest incisions are going to be the incisions for the screws. You know, that's like a one inch incision or so, um, unless you do like two incisions for you know one for each screw on on each side. So like for, for total four incisions. Um, so that's usually like the the largest incision. Um, the accessory portal for the endoscope is is a lot smaller. So. Um, the advantage, I think, potentially, and I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make this, you know, truly uh, a value add. But I think right now the value add is that you can directly visualize and the adequacy of your discectomy. Um, but I don't. I think you can do a, a better job of doing the discectomy, even just with the percutaneous instruments, a lot faster uh, than doing all through the endoscope. Um, and I think a lot of the variations are: Do you do you, the inner body portion of the fusion before or after the pedicle screws? So, like, for Mark did it before the pedicle screws here, but typically I like to do it after because I'm going to make the bigger incision. I'm going to take advantage of that bigger incision for my pedicle screws, and then do as much as I can under direct vision, microscope, you know, whatever, and then we'll do the discectomy and endoscopic uh, disc, uh, disc prep. So, you know, historical challenges, uh, you must perform an adequate discectomy and plate prep equivalent to open or MIS technique, because, you know, we've heard it all day and yesterday, it has to be reproducible, has to get as equal results as, you know, open or MIS. Um, some of the challenges are small cannulas, limit the inner body prosthesis size, you can have subsidence. Um, you want to be able to maintain standard alignment, and you know, with the discectomy, with these small implants, you don't want to have an overaggressive curettage because that further risks subsidence. Um, I think in the past, the ability to pack bone graft really well uh, because you didn't have the flowable DBMs. You know, that's been overcome recently, and of course, there's not much published literature on this. So, concepts uh, for targeting this space, you know, that's the you know, a lot of this course is targeting how do you get in the right spot, right? And so here, you definitely want to get the optimal skin incision to get the optimal angle into the disc space so you can get a wide uh, discectomy. So this is just showing if you have a 45 degree angle into the disc space, that's probably the best trajectory to get full discectomy. Uh, if you start too shallow, too lateral, you'll come in too shallow, and this is kind of like the, the area of your uh, discectomy and prep, and if you're too medial, you know, then you're gonna be, you know, more lateral in the, in the disc space. So you wanna go for the 45 degree angle, and then you can do your shaper, scrape out the end plates um, and the disc, and then use your curettes to go more contralateral and more ipsilateral. And also, you know, you want to be in line with the disc space as Ray was showing in his uh, his um, demonstration because you don't want to gouge into into one um, end plate. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of preoperative planning, this was Ray didn't have that MRI. You want to measure the distance from the posterior skin to the center of the disc in the midline, and typically, you know, maybe that's nine centimeters, ten centimeters, and then you go that distance from the midline, uh, and that's going to be your lateral starting point because, you know, geometry. You connect those, go to the center of the disc. That's 45 degrees. So, simple geometry. So. Want your optimal angle? I thought the sound was going to be on here, but he says, "Hey, you want your optimal angle? Maybe you can get the sound for the later one." Whoever, well, IT guy is not there anymore. But uh, anyway, so here's the protocol. So obviously, get the true PA and lateral views. Uh, you'll draw the midline uh, line. You'll draw lines um, perpendicular to, or parallel with the disc space, and see where those cross. And that's kind of like your 
um, overview of your anatomic disc center. So you're kind of making these lines so that you can kind of visualize where that's gonna be. And then you draw a line parallel to the midline at nine centimeters if that's what you've measured. And then I saw earlier yesterday, some people would then also do it like a centimeter or two uh, medial, a centimeter or two lateral, and that way you can you know, play around and if you need to make some fine adjustments. Once you make those lines, then you get a lateral, as Ray showed you, and measure the disc inclination line. This will give you your cephalad and caudal starting point. So if you're at like say L3, L4 and it's straight up and down, uh, it's gonna be in the same line as your transverse disc plane. So here, uh, once you find that disc inclination line, you see where that basically intersects with that lateral line that was parallel to the midline. And that's gonna be your starting point or skin window. And you can see at L5S1, it's gonna be cephalad to your typical transverse line, which I draw in just a straight AP, not with the Ferguson. Uh, we go to the Ferguson after we start working. And then L4-5 is usually right in line. Um, so this is a little bit off, but it's, it's usually right in line. And that puts you at about 45 degrees or 40 degrees, you know, because the disc base is a little bit wider than it is uh, deep anterior posterior. Uh, so, you know, that's a good starting point. And typically, when you either put your needle or your starting jam sheeting needle into the disc base, you're gonna look like this. It's gonna be center, center. You know, it's gonna be centered on the AP, it's gonna be centered on the lateral, and it's gonna be parallel to the disc space. Um, and, you know, It'll look kind of like this. We've seen this all day the last two days. You know, this is a standard position. Um, and you know, you have the anatomic disc center kind of measured out so you have an idea of where you're uh, aiming for, and then you've got your skin window all calculated and you're parallel to the disc space. Um, once you do that, you know, there's a lot of instruments that uh, you can use, and obviously you can do it like they just demonstrated earlier through the endoscope, through the endoscopic uh, pituitaries, the drill and everything, that's very tedious, right? Um, you know, to do that and then do the bigger, more destructive things, I, I think it makes sense to do it the other way around. So typically, once you get your starting point, your guide wire, get down into the disc, you're safe, you put the cannula in, you're now protecting all the neural structures, then you put the big aggressive stuff in there. You do your drill, okay? You do the shaper blade that can expand. So this is just like your typical open MIS and plate debriders. You know, you go like seven millimeters, eight millimeters, nine millimeters, 10 millimeters. You know, this, this can go, it's expandable. Then you use your articulating curettes and try to go to both the contralateral side and then the ipsilateral side and just you gotta do it systematically and think of like quadrants and stuff. And as we all know, you can play around with the wanding a little bit of your cannula to, because you, you're not totally fixed in that 45 degrees. You can push it more medial to get more steep. You can push it down uh, more laterally and to get across the contralateral side. And then pituitaries, you're flushing it out. And then at the end, the wire brush, someone said, hey, wire brush, that's not gonna do much. But that cleans up all the debris, all the crap, you know? And it really gums it up and, and takes everything out. Because if you went in and kept picking it out with a pituitary, it'd take you all day. So um, some very good ins you know, instrumentation for the discectomy. So this is just one example of the adjustable end plate scrapers, you know, from one company and the articulating curette. There's a few companies that have this. Um, additionally, there's other discectomy type uh, instruments like this suction irrigation shaver, you know? So you can go in and really suck out all that debris, um, discectomy and, 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 the, and the cartilage. Uh, so the endoscope, so what value does it have? So after you do all this percutaneous work, then you can go in with your endoscope and it's kind of like fine tuning. You know, you're looking, you verify on the left, on the right, you know, your end plates are prepped, they're bleeding, and you also see if there's any areas that you didn't get, you know, and you can reach it with your pituitary or whatever, or, you know, it's something to target with the curettes, you know. Um, additionally, there's other tools like contrast filled balloons. So you basically put a balloon in there, fill it with contrast, and in this example, you can see it's not touching all the way up to the end plates, up to L4 end plate. Then you know there's tissue there, right? And so you gotta go in there, do your discectomy prep a little bit better on that area, put the balloon back in, oh, now it's touching the bone. So you got rid of all the cartilage and the disc space. And 
not only can you get a lateral here, but if you get like an extreme Ferguson or extreme reverse Ferguson on an AP, you get sort of an axial view of that balloon. And you can kind of see where you are centered in that the air and you get a, almost a view like that upper uh, right cartoon. Um, so, you know, talk about how, how can you tell, you know, if you did a good enough job endoscopically or percutaneously. So we did a, actually a study, and, and uh, disclosure, this was sponsored by Globus Medical, but they compared uh, MIS T-lift disc prep versus percutaneous disc prep and got eight different surgeons. Each surgeon did one level of MIS disc prep and one level of percutaneous disc prep um, in different cavers. So, you know, again, same uh, tools. So there was no endoscope involved in this. It was all percutaneous. So interestingly, the MIS T-lift technique took an average of 34 minutes and the percutaneous technique took 31 minutes, so a little bit faster. So interesting, we break that down in terms of disc access versus disc prep. It was faster disc access for the percutaneous, um, but the disc prep took longer. I think it's, you know, you're just not having as much exposure, um, so it, it took longer, but uh, the disc prep part took longer, but the total prep time was actually faster. Um, and, you know, we talk about doing it for the benefit of our patients, you know. We never want to have a nerve injury, but when, every time you put that instrument past the nerves, there's a chance for a nerve injury, catching the nerve. So when you put the cannula into the disc, no matter how many times you pass instruments in there, the nerves are protected. So there were many, much less um, unprotected passes of instruments past the nerves with the percutaneous uh, discectomy. So that could potentially be a safer thing. And then here's the money uh, shot. Like what, how, how did we do? How did, how did the MIS T-lift versus the percutaneous disc prep work? Well, it was almost exactly the same. Uh, percutaneous exposed 33% of the superior end plate and 34% of the inferior end plate, com very comparable to MIS. So it was exactly the same. So I think this, you know, with eight different series, one just like one expert or anything, so eight different people. Um, so here's just a quick case example, uh, grade two spondylolisthesis, severe stenosis, um, you know, dynamic uh, spondylolisthesis. This is kind of pushing the envelope, but, you know, it's, again, not, um, you know, just endoscopic. It's doing an MIS T-lift. I'm just using the endoscope to help verify adequate discectomy. So you can see here uh, that there's screws already placed. I use a, a pedicle-based retractor, um, do the total facetectomy under a microscope, and then, you know, when I put all the endoscopic equipment in more laterally through an accessory portal, you know, I, I don't have to do fluoro or anything. I, I use nav now so I can get the nav and put it on the, the air and make sure I'm doing the right trajectory. Do all your percutaneous disc prep, then you come in, put the endoscope, verify everything is nicely uh, prepped, take out some stragglers, and then start putting your bone graft, and then your prosthesis. Here we use bag of bones, you know, and you can see great disc height restoration, um, and, uh, you know, with bag of bones, you know, that's one option, you know, bigger end plate coverage, you know, so less chance for subsidence, um, but it's just one of, uh, many options. Oops. So uh, here's just sort of, that was really fast, um, but this is just sort of the view uh, through the microscope on the right on the screen. So the screws are there, pedicle based retractor, um, the, you can see the dura and the exiting nerve root, and there's our kind of initial dilator probe in the, in the annulus. Um, and then here's our cannula placement, and you can look at under direct vision, we're also looking at it on an endoscopic screen. Here's just kind of the setup right there. You can see the pedicle screw sticking out, and I did as much work as I could through the pedicle screw incisions, and then you know the the poster lateral accessory portal for the disc prep and the application of the inner body prosthesis. And here's just showing nice ebridated bone, um, and then just kind of the the sequence here, and then. The, the final result. So 
again, that's just one implant you could do like this implant that's been previously shown. This is a Chol Kim case, very similar stuff. You put two, two uh, cages in there. Um, one thing that has made this all possible, because in the past, it was impossible, but you can truly now make the ship in the bottle, so to speak, right? We have these expandable implants. So all these young guys, it's like you start training, it's like, dude, expandable, yes, awesome. It took, you know, a long time for these to develop. These are like cool toys and stuff, but there's a bunch of, bunch of options right now. And of course, the flowable bone graft makes it all possible to do it through a, through a tube and everything. Before, like when I started, we were using, just crush cancellous stuff, um, kind of painful. So take home tips. If you're interested in doing, being an endoscopic spine surgery, this is probably the easiest way to start because you can just do your standard MIST lift and then once you do the approach, you expose the disc, you make a little angulotomy, then you can start doing, practicing your percutaneous slash endoscopic discectomy, okay? And then after you're done, you can check it with your MIST lift tools. And surprisingly, and even with that, the study that we did, you know, you always feel like, okay, if I got the bigger tools, MIST tools, I can maybe do a little bit better job. I was really surprised. I did a few cases like these and I went with my MIST lift stuff. Didn't really get much more stuff. Did a really good job. To your point, you know, how good of a disc prep can you do? Um, and so, you know, if you do that, and that'll also kind of get you fast out with just using the endoscopic tools, and then you can start doing it with the decompressions, because that's a lot harder than just putting it in the center of the disc and scraping and, and pulling out a bunch of stuff, because you got it for the discectomy's decompression, you gotta make sure that nerve's decompressed. You don't have to just destroy stuff and take it out. So, um, yeah. Just remember, I don't, I don't know if we have like the volume. Ah. He says, remember, optimal angle, kids. <laughs> <laughs>